Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, Sundar Vedantan. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Thank you all for coming over on a Saturday morning. Uh, really appreciate your uh, time. Let's get this done. <coughs>
this is a picture of Janus. Many of you may know this. It's a god in Roman mythology. Janus is the god of beginnings, transitions, doorways, duality, um, and endings. Uh, I thought this is a good metaphor to bring in deep in our mind as we uh, discuss this topic, uh, because how we are going to solve the problem or how AI affects the society um, has a lot of baggage of how technology evolved over years, how jobs shifted, um, how the society handled it, how it modified itself. Uh, so we need to have that perspective, we need to have that history in our mind uh, to see what is going to happen in the future. But what is going to happen in the future is not going to be a simple trajectory so you can easily extrapolate and then uh, do the same thing next to get things done right. right? So you need to have a, a, another uh, look out on the future, how things may drastically change. It may not evolve the way that you are expecting it to. Uh, so we do need to have the history, but we do need to have a vision in the future also to uh, get the evolving technologies handled correctly. So I'd like to keep this image in your mind and then in the end we'll see if it uh, ties up correctly. Right. Um, so right away, since this is a talk on ethics, uh, many of you may be familiar with this problem, so I'd like to start with this one. Uh, this was introduced in the 70s as an ethics-based thought experiment. It's uh, fairly well known as a trolley <coughs> experiment. Uh, in this uh, experiment, thought experiment that was proposed by Philip Park Ford. Uh, there is a train track, and there is a trolley uh, on the track, basically like a, a train uh, that's there that somehow got unmoved, and then it's just running down the track. Right? If you don't do anything, you can see there are five workers working on the track, and it's going to kill them all. Um, so you are the person uh, standing here and you have a lever. If you pull the lever, it's going to transfer the train into the alternate track. So it, instead of coming down straight, it's going to go in this track, and it's going to end up killing one worker working on that track. Right? The question is, will you pull the lever or won't you? Uh, when this question is asked multiple number of times uh, to people all over the world, irrespective of what religion they belong to, whether they are rich or poor, most people say, yeah, I'm going to pull the lever because it's better to save uh, five people instead of one. You are saving four human lives, so this is good. Okay, that, that's good. But then this thought experiment can be quickly changed in so many different ways. So we pose an alternate situation where you are not standing next to the lever that you can pull, Instead of that, you are actually standing on top of a bridge and there is another person standing next to you just looking up. Right? So, same situation, the train is rolling down. Now, instead of pulling the lever, you have to push this person over the bridge onto the track. right? And the train is going to hit him and that's going to stop the train. And you are again going to save five people. So you are killing a person, saving five, so would you do that? When this question is asked, most people stand back. Somehow they can't bring themselves to say, yeah, I'm saving five lives and sacrificing one, and I'm good to go, and I'll push that person out. They don't say that. They, they stand back. They mostly say they won't do it. Many are not able to explain why, right? but it is this People who have thought about it say that in the first case, mm -hmm. death is going to happen one way or another and you are not physically touching the person and that uh, the other worker is already on the track. Right? You are just changing the direction of the train and it so happens that the other person dies. Whereas in the second case, you are physically pushing a person who is not involved in the whole picture at all onto the track, so you are bringing that connection in, and so people become hesitant and they don't want to do that. Right? So, uh, of course, uh, we can keep talking about this experiment alone for a long time. People who do say that they will push that person, uh, they have 
sometimes some uh, brain deficiencies or their thinking is different. In those situations, they are even willing to kill a person to save five people, getting that person's kidney, heart, lung to do transplant to them. Ethically, that looks right, but that's not how most of us think, right? So, why are we talking about uh, this particular issue? Um, that's because when we talk about autonomous driving, this picture comes into play, right? So, so far in the 70s when it was originally proposed, it was just a thought experiment. Uh, so, it was done in fact to show that whether you are a religious person or an uh, atheist or you are agnostic or you are rich or poor, where you live, it doesn't matter. All over the world, human beings have this innate sense of what is right and what is wrong. Right? That, that was the intention of the uh, original experiment to, to question that to see if that is true or false. But as we come into this newer age where cars are becoming self-driving, now this question comes into play. In the rear wall, instead of the unmoved train, there is a car running down the uh, road and there is a pedestrian suddenly coming uh, into the road. So the driver hitting the brake and stopping the car was so far left to the nature, the reflex of the driver, whether the driver saw the person or not and the mechanics of the car and so forth. right? But when it becomes a self-driving car, you can actually program this entirely using algorithms. You can tell the car, if there is a person, stop, don't stop. And why wouldn't you want to stop? There are reasons. So, for example, let's say a person crosses the road and then you, the self-driving car really hits the brake hard, right? And then the pedestrian just walks away, nothing happened to him or her. But the driver sitting in the car or the passenger sitting in the car gets his face punched, right? Loses a couple of teeth. That person is going to sue the car company now, right? And there is nobody died, so the, the person saved that becomes irrelevant to this particular case, and the car company has to say why this person got the teeth uh, knocked out, and there is no evidence to the good thing that happened, right? Um, this is really becoming an issue now. And so there are uh, countries, for example, Germany is asking why should a software engineer sitting in California decide what happens in German roads, in what's the priority, right? And the, some of the car companies do say things like, hey, somebody bought my car, paid so much money for the technology, so our loyalty is to our passenger, right? So I'm going to protect him or her first before the, the passenger. I mean, before the pedestrian. You can't really argue with that. I mean, they, they do have a point. They have a fiduciary duty to their shareholders. So what do you do? Um, so if this is a simple question, uh, like we said, innately, people have the same model and then we just um, agree on one, one simple uh, notion, that would be great. But MIT has been running this uh, a website called Moral Machine. It's a survey. Uh, they've collected about 2.3 million answers so far. The survey is still open. You are welcome to go put in your uh, input as well. Uh, they pose the same set of questions, but instead of simply saying there is a person, whether you kill or not, etc., they try to get into different scenarios to see how people answer. Right. So that what you see. In this area, these are called spiral charts, so it indicates uh, different uh, participants' uh, response. Um, so, for example, if um, somebody says, okay, we should always spare the pedestrian, right? So it, it pulls the, the graph towards that side. Then maybe somebody says, oh, we should always spare the young, and somebody with the uh, higher status should be spared. So there could be all these variations. Right? You can imagine, this is an interesting experiment to post. You can ask your friends, uh, your family to see how they respond. And they found that overall, in the Western nations that are indicated by this pink um, uh, color, versus Eastern countries, uh, China, India, etc., showed in blue, versus the green countries that are like Latin America, uh, etc. 
the responses are quite different, right? So if you look at uh, countries in the south, they usually say, oh, we should spare the end. That's why that the green is projecting onto the side. And then uh, there's also the notion of, oh, we should spare the higher status people. So that could be, I don't know, a movie star or somebody who generated hundreds of jobs uh, over there, somebody famous, maybe an author, uh, anybody, right? So they want to protect uh, those people compared to somebody else. So they, I mean, taking the other end, so we preferring inaction. So in the green zone, nobody wants to say, oh, I don't care whatever happens, just let nature take its course. They don't say that. Whereas if you go to the blue shaded countries, um, many prefer inaction and they don't want to spare the young and, and so forth, right? So there is a lot of variation in how people react. So when self-driving cars start to implement algorithms, so these notions need to be taken into account. So how are we going to accommodate that? And so should those sensibilities be written into the algorithms or should we evolve some sort of a worldwide common ethical standards that we all adhere to, right? Uh, you, you can look into uh, this site and then contribute your thoughts also. Uh, it's, a, it's an ongoing experiment. Uh, this, switching over to a different kind of ethical uh, dilemma, this is called a Shirley card. Uh, it was originally designed and printed out by Kodak. So in the 60s, uh, they originally started developing color cameras, uh, the color film. Uh, they didn't want all the film to be shipped only to Kodak where they can only print that was creating a bottleneck. They wanted to diversify, uh, distribute the business all over the world. So they developed a printer uh, so that individual photo labs can be set up all over the uh, country, so they can print out uh, films that people bought and then uh, develop uh, locally. That was great. Um, but this is early part of color photography, and so the, the chemicals need to be correctly balanced, the paper need to be set up right, the temperature of the uh, processing uh, setup should be exactly right, and so forth. So they wanted a simple uh, procedure that the lab technicians in the labs all over the country can follow uh, that would make sure the printouts that are coming out, the photo that are printed out will all be perfect. So in order to do that, they created this one photograph. Then with, with the lab equipment, they will ship this particular photo all over the country. So when they set up the machine initially, or maybe daily, They'll print this one photo out, this one negative out, to see how it comes out. Then they'll compare it side by side, and if any tween, tuning need to be done, they'll do that so that subsequent print that they develop for their customers will all be great. Right? Good idea, simple idea, it's all fantastic. But the problem was it was calibrated for Caucasian skin tone. So when you start uh, printing uh, non white subjects, it wasn't coming out that very well, right? And it wasn't even recognized immediately by Kodak. Uh, I mean, the whole color photography was new, so they would just print it out and people just took, okay, that's how I got my picture, kind of thing, <laughs> uh, for, for a while, right? And then, actually, there were chocolate companies that were using Kodak film to picture their own products and material, and they were the ones complaining, hey, it doesn't look like my product that much you guys need to fix it. Right? And of course, Kodak eventually came up with a, a multiracial uh, model uh, image that could be used to uh, get this correction done, and then the, the thing slowly evolved. Uh, but why are we talking about it? That these things continue to persist in the system for a long, long, long time, right? It doesn't go away uh, that easily. So I have uh, another video clip, uh, but chart of time, so I'll just move on. So if you look at this one, this is on YouTube. Uh, so there was a gentleman, this is just about 10 years back. So this is not the 60s, I think this is just in like uh, 2006, 7 kind of time frame. Uh, so he, this gentleman bought a HD computer, 
that is supposed to have uh, facial, mean, facial recognition. Um, so when you move in front of your computer, the camera is supposed to adjust to keep your face in the middle of the, uh, the picture frame. Right? So there is a nice demonstration where he is showing that when he is there, when he is moving, the computer is not tracking him at all. This is just a off-the-shelf computer bought uh, from Best Buy, right? nothing, nothing uh, unusual. But one of his uh, uh, white counterpart comes in, then it correctly recognizes something, <laughs> moves about. Uh, so it, it's an amusing video to see. And of course, if you look it, look it up on YouTube, uh, you would see Consumer Reports has actually posted a uh, kind of a refutal saying, oh, it's not really intentional or anything. It's a question of this lighting. What's really amusing is they, when, when they are trying to show that, they really need to try two, three, four times to get the lighting right and when it starts working correctly, right? Um, so that Shirley card idea is still perpetuating through the uh, 10 years back, right? So if you say, ah, that's still 10 years back, it's not a big deal. Let's get to facial recognition now, right? Um, there's been a New York Times article, so the references are at the bottom, so you can look it up. Uh, so, uh, organizations took existing pictures and went to facial recognition systems to see how well it recognizes people, person, gender, things like that, right? So when it is light-skinned men, the uh, error rate was like really, really low. Uh, I think this one, like this 1% of uh, light-skinned males are kind of identified incorrectly, 99%, it's great, fantastic. If you go to women, then the error rate became like 7. It's already a big jump. Then if you go to darker skin, brown uh, skin men, it became about 12%. And then if you go to uh, darker skin women, it's about uh, 35%, which is really high. This is basic gender identification that is still incorrect, right? Uh, if you look at... <coughs> Um, Amazon, they have a software called Recognition. Um, so this Werner, Werner Global is uh, uh, the chief of the image recognition division. Uh, so they were doing demos showing that up to like 98% of the time it always identifies uh, him, the people correctly, right? Which is true. Uh, but if you really dig into it, uh, again, uh, this, uh, I think ACLU, took that software as is, they didn't change anything, right? And then they ran it against all the um, uh, lawmakers in the congressmen, uh, senators in the, in the Congress to see how it does. And it identified 28 lawmakers as criminals against this song. Wow. Right? And, and, and of course, uh, when Amazon was contacted, they pointed out that by default their settings are set in some way and that's not how it is used by police department or somebody else to identify criminals, so that's not the right way you need to fine tune it, which is okay, uh, which is correct. But the point is, um, these things persist, these things exist in the system, right? So by default, if you just uh, take it up, things, they, they, they don't work um, correctly. And why is it like that? That's because basically the models that we use to train these systems tends to be skewed. Uh, so there is a database called Faces in the Wild. So that's basically a collection of images from the web. They all tend to skew one way or another and that's what AI algorithms uh, tend to learn. Right? So that, that need to be corrected. So there has to be a cognitive, there is a conscious process that is needed uh, to make sure these things don't happen. And of course, efforts are always ongoing. So MIT has started um, a, a project to address particularly facial recognition related issues. So if you are developing a new algorithm, you are welcome to send it to them and then they will run it against a wide range of uh, uh, people, texture, tone, etc. and then give you a grade as to how well your software did and then you can uh, work to improve it considerably. Uh, so, solutions are possible, but 
that has to come into our consciousness, right? So we can't say, ah, it works in whatever test set that I work with, and so it's good to go. And then whatever happens, we will fix it in the future, because it's going to affect people now uh, in the system. Again, you may ask, why are we talking about this for so long? This is just a sample uh, issue, right? Correct a sample issue should go away. Um, we are talking about that mainly because of Moore's law. Right? Um, the speed with which things can change, the speed with which it can really go out and reach a large audience, large systems, is phenomenal in, in this domain, in this case, compared to whatever that was happening in previous technologies. Right? Um, so, I picked this one up from this particular um, article. There is a, a website called Wait But Why. There is one uh, author who writes there really nice, very well written, easy to read article. So there is one on artificial intelligence. It's a rather long one, but I highly recommend it. Uh, he really talks about the evolution, explains it really well uh, to see how far it can go and what kind of uh, effect it can have on the society. So one thing he's pointing out is, the, if you really look at um, how much of uh, computing power that is actually building up, you can see in the 1960s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it, it's building up the effect of Moore's law. But you don't really see the, the well filling up, right? So this is actually, they just used Lake, Lake Michigan's volume as, as a, a visual representation of what's, uh, what goes on. So you can see for how long, since 70s, 80s, 90s, things have been going on, but you don't see anything. But within some 10 years, suddenly it just shoots up and fills the whole thing, right? That's the power of uh, Moore's Law. So I usually use this one particular spreadsheet to sort of explain uh, what's going on. Um, you all might have heard the story, uh, but this helps us understand the uh, the rise of exponential rise, how powerful and how important it is, right? So a long time back, there was a chess player. Um, he goes around the world uh, playing with uh, the best chess players in each country. When he comes to one country, he tells the king, hey, I'm, I'm a good chess player, I'd like to play against your uh, best player. The king says, okay, go, great. Then he just beats everyone uh, in the country, right? Then comes back to the king. He says, oh, fantastic, I'm really impressed. I'd like to give you a really nice gift. What would you like? Ask me anything. The chess player says, well, King, I'm just a poor chess player. Uh, my whole life depends on just uh, this one board. So I'm, I like rice. I eat rice all the time. So just give me one grain of rice on the first square of my uh, chess board. Right? Then just double it on the second square. Then double it again on the third, double it again on the fourth, and just keep doing it until you get to the end of my chessboard, and that's all I need. King says, that's all you want? I mean, I can give you a lot more. I, mean, I was hoping you would ask for a lot more uh, bigger price. No, 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 that, that's good enough. Okay. Just do that. Uh, he says, okay, you give us a one whole bag of rice. Just take it. If that's all you want, you can have a whole bag. He says, no, no, no. Actually, do the computation and then show that to me. If you are giving me up to the 64 squares. I'm the one who put together this spreadsheet and uh, I asked this question to people over and over. It's impossible for human mind to understand how much this can really grow into, right? So, as we know, on square one, you are going to have just one uh, one grain of rice, and two, it's going to be two, and so on. So, by the time you go to 10 squares, or on 512, right? Still, it's trivial. So, if you ask people how many do you think it will come to uh, in the end, uh, people say, well, maybe billion, two billion grains, right? Something like that. So, just to make this convenient, I'm converting that one grain of rice into kilograms, and usually rice is sold in 100 kilogram bags, so I'm converting it into bags, and then that's converted into metric tons, and then uh, per year, we produce about 700 million metric tons of rice all over the world, okay? And this is just as of like last year. Um, you know, years before, we were not producing that much. If we go 100 years back, we don't have to do 
So that's all great, right? So if you do 10, okay, you got just uh, 512 uh, grains. Anybody want to take a guess as to how high this is going to go to? 